In October 2011, whilst working at a Danish demining project with the Danish Refugee Council in Kalkayo, Somalia, Jessica Buchanan and Paul Hagen Thisted were kidnapped by pirates. Diplomatic efforts via the Somali and traditional elders had failed and the pirates reportedly refused a $1.5 million ransom offer. Buchanan's health was declining rapidly, so the State Department decided to rescue the hostages by force. As Blue Squadron were on standby, they would be the ones to conduct the rescue. Blue Squadron, having only recently come off deployment from Afghanistan, were out in Arizona, conducting high-altitude, high-opening parachute jumps to test the latest O2 respirator masks. As they were repacking their chutes, their phones started to beep and buzz frantically. It was a command recall. They were ordered home and back to the command at Virginia Beach, immediately. As the team listened to the FBI proof-of-life calls, a stunned silence filled the room. The wrought emotion in Jessica's voice as she pleaded to send help was all the motivation the team needed. On the ISR feed in the team room, a little camp with the blonde-haired female under a tree came into view, along with another hostage close by. They immediately got to work putting their plan together, poring over terrain imagery, weather maps and historic intel, anything they could get their hands on. With the plan in place, Blue Squadron began training immediately, along with an EOD tech and two power rescuemen. Day and night the squadron trained, setting up every conceivable scenario they could come up with. It's rumoured that they hired female role players to train with, which were hidden in the CQB house with active shooters for greater realism. Hostage rescue missions are intrinsically different to kill or capture missions, as the goal is to keep the hostages alive at all costs. As soon as the first bullet flies, it's likely only a matter of seconds before the hostages could be killed. This means no self-preservation, disregarding all typical tactics and procedures normally employed. The team had to be ready to give their lives for Jessica and Paul. It wasn't for another three months until President Obama and Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta finally gave the green light. Operation Octave Fusion was a go. Under the cover of darkness, the operators from Blue Squadron loaded up into a C-17 from their private airstrip in Virginia Beach. Two in-flight refuels would be needed on the 20-hour flight to Camp Lemonnier in Djibouti. Upon landing at the chaotic airfield, equipment was already being staged and gear prepped. Not only were aircraft already being moved around the flight line, but even ships off the coast of Somalia were being retasked to support the mission. The total operational cost was likely well over $100 million at this point. As per protocol, a full rehearsal in concept was conducted via video teleconference back to JSOC, the Pentagon and the White House. But there was a problem. Whilst weather was being briefed, it became apparent that not only was there to be extremely high winds, but there would also be a solar flare, which could disrupt both aircraft and operator GPS. The team decided to go anyway and would give a mission approval. Due to high winds, the plan was to land to the south and walk north towards the camp. As they approached the target, they would head east in order to come in from east to west, walking into the wind to reduce any smells giving away their position. Interestingly, the team later learned that the militants had planned to move the hostages this night, but due to eating some bad lamb meat and feeling unwell, they hadn't. Early on January 25th, 2012, inside of their hangar, the team packed their parachutes together. Team leaders walked up and down checking O2 bottles were correctly attached and full. The team would pre-breathe O2 for an hour in flight prior to jumping. The C-130 fired up, blowing hot diesel air into the night. As the ramp closed, the team settled into their seats in the darkness and the plane took off. The flight took three hours and the team would exit the C-130 at 20,000 feet. Incredibly, most of the team slept for the first two hours. At 30 minutes out, a radio call was made warning them of wind speeds which would double the accepted maximum risk. But this was no ordinary mission, and the team agreed to accept the risk. 10 minutes out, the team began stretching and readying themselves for the jump. At the 3 minute mark, the ramp of the C-130 opened, presenting a pitch black, lifeless landscape. The time for practice was over. The jump light turned from a solid green to a flashing red and green, and the team jumped into the abyss. Falling at 120 miles per hour, with 150 pounds of kit strapped to them, they opened their pilot chutes, which billowed into life. As they passed through the 17,000 feet mark at 109 miles per hour, this continued until 10,000 feet, where it became clear just how strong the winds were. It was so dark that none of the team had enough ambient light for their night vision, meaning they couldn't see the ground at all. At 5,000 feet, the team could still not see the ground and were now traveling backwards, having to shift their angles in the stack to ensure they landed where they needed to. They braced for a hard landing. 
As the operators thudded into the earth, or indeed one member, a thorn bush, there were loud howling shrieks. Despite the high winds, the pitch black and the hard landing, the team had also now caught the attention of a pack of hyenas. The team quickly removed their flight gear, assembled their weapons and readied to move, carefully piling the now surplus items into one area and rigging it with explosives to be detonated when they successfully exfilled. Radioing the Blackhawks who had to pick them up, the SEALs relayed that they were moving out. The plan was to be no more than an hour from jumping out of the C-130 to the recce portion of the patrol moving out. The team had made it in 59 minutes. At the second checkpoint, the operators altered their direction towards the east, following their plan. The 20 to 30 mile an hour winds lashed sand at them, making movement difficult. Now 700 meters out, with clouds moving in and the solar flare in full force, the team lost radio comms with base. The night was so black, the visibility through night vision goggles looked like TV static. At 500 meters out, using their thermal scopes, it became clear that despite it being the middle of the night, the entire camp was awake. Now moving silently, with just hand signals, the troop were in a wedge formation, six feet apart. Scanning the night for any movement, there were two armed sentries under a tree. Spotting the operators, they began shouting back to their crew in Somali, who were hanging around two vehicles to the rear. With their lasers now focused on the two sentries, the SEAL Team 6 troops continued forward, watching the sentries join back up with the rest of the pirates. Now at a slow jog, the nine pirates picked up their weapons, quickly moving into cover positions using the small elements of terrain within and around the camp. The troop could hear belt-fed machine guns being racked. It would now only be a matter of seconds before the night turned to day. Now running towards the camp, the two pirate-manned PKM machine guns opened fire at the squadron, sending hundreds of 7.62 caliber rounds zipping towards the operators, lighting up the night sky. Hectic AK-47 fire followed. The two team snipers engaged, eliminating the two sentries seen earlier. As the operators continued to shoot and maneuver their way into the camp, they began to wonder where the hostages were. Getting to them as quickly as possible was priority one. It was then the team leader spotted Buchanan, who was on her back in between two pirate captors. Three operators broke off and disposed of the two pirates guarding her. As two of the three operators now at full sprint lowered their weapons so the barrels wouldn't burn her, they jumped onto Buchanan, forming a human shield on top of her, with the third operator standing atop them, covering their position. Jackpot Hotel was sent over the radio. As the threat from the other five pirates was deftly removed, the operators with Buchanan picked her up and sprinted back the way they came, taking her away in case the pirates had a quick reaction force nearby. Telling her that she was now safe from harm, the two operators that had set Buchanan down called for the two PJs to come and start taking her vitals. Confirming that she was in no immediate medical danger, the second hostage Thisted emerged from the darkness with another operator who had followed the exact same procedure as those who had rescued Buchanan. The remaining operators and EOD tech gathered up the enemy weapons into a pile and rigged it to blow once they were aboard the helicopters and away. As the Blackhawks flared down onto their location, the two operators carried Buchanan into the helicopter. As they took off into the lightless black sky, the radio fizzed into life. Nine enemy killed in action. Two hotels, Oscar. All eagles, Oscar.